again, and, and the new folks that are here as well. Um, we're here this afternoon for a workshop in case number 19-0705-PET, which is a request from the Vermont Department of Public Service for a workshop regarding service provider backup power obligations. Uh, this is our third workshop. Uh, the purpose of the third workshop, as I indicated in the, in the order that established that we would do it, uh, is to provide the participants with the opportunity to make presentations both summarizing methods used for ensuring compliance with 47 CFR section 12.5 and recommending best practices for minimizing disruptions to E911 service, 911 services during power outages. Workshop participants have been encouraged to file the draft presentations. Uh, I did see most of them. Well, at least all the ones that are filed, I've seen them, if there are any others that have not yet been filed. Um, and they're encouraged uh, to take the opportunity today uh, to, to briefly summarize them and be available for questions and comment about their presentations. Uh, any questions about where we're going to? Uh, as I noted in, in the order establishing the third workshop, we're going to do a fourth workshop sometime uh, in October, probably early October. In order that I have more time to prepare a draft report to the, uh, to the legislature, uh, and then I can give, give you all a chance to look at that before it goes out. So we want to try to get that meeting as early as possible so we can get that report to the legislature in December as, uh, as required. That I think I'll ask who's here. Starting with the department. Sarah Sevens, Department of Public Service. Clay Purvis, Department of Public Service. Kara Flint, Department of Public Service. Nancy Malmquist, down for Acton Martin, here for Charter Fiber Link, Vermont, CCO, this morning. Marcia Brown from Changing Fiber. Melissa Pierce, Comcast. Jerry Tarrant, Eric Gillis, and Richardson for Comcast. Jim White, Comcast. Jeff Austin, Consolidated. Paul Phillips uh, from the law firm of Kramer, Piper, Eggleston, Kramer, uh, here in Montpelier, Vermont, for the eight uh, Vermont rural telephone companies. And I won't list them, uh, but they do include uh, Vermont Telephone Company. Uh, Jennifer Matthews, uh, select board member, town of Mount Holly. Jonathan Gibson, a resident of Shrewsbury. Madeline Bowden from the select board of the town. I'm Chuck Finberg, also from the town of Shrewsbury. Gordon Matthews, Vermont Telephone Company. Zach Cominelli, Vermont Public Interest Research Group, EPIRG. Ben Brassard, Public Service. I'm Barbara Hill, Executive Director of the 911 Board. I want to just mention that unfortunately I have a conflict at 2 o'clock, so I'll be meeting about 10 of and hope to return as soon as possible. Not here when it comes up. Uh, one of the uh, participants, I want to think it's Shrewsbury, talked about the development of the E911 uh, utility. Uh, I'm just wondering how duplicative would that be of the E911 <coughs> board? And if you could, uh, to provide a little bit of background to the folks here as to what the E911 board does and where its authority comes from, what, you know. Money comes from all that kind of stuff. If you could also, if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to start with you once I find out who's on the phone. Uh, who's on the phone? Hi, this is Susan Berlin for Charter. I'm sorry, could you repeat the name, please? Sure, it's Susan Berlin, like the city, B E R L I N. Thanks. Is there anybody else on the phone? Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, Ms. Neal. Sure. So the Vermont Enhanced 911 Board um, is the single governmental agency responsible for the statewide 911 system in Vermont. And our authority is uh, in um, 30 VSA 7051 through another number, <laughs> 7060 perhaps. Um, and so we have the responsibility for the oversight management of the uh, statewide 911 system. The board itself is made up of nine members representing um, state, local, and county law enforcement. 
EMS, uh, emergency medical services, a fire service representative, a town or municipal representative, and then three members of the public. Um, we have staff 10 who does the day-to-day -day, uh, management of the 911 system, and we have um, partnerships um, with, the, with various uh, state, county, and local law enforcement agencies for a total of six Vermont public safety answering points where all of the 911 calls are answered. Um, we do not provide that service ourselves, rather we, we um, have these memorandum of understandings uh, with those folks to do that. Um, the question of how duplicative the uh, E911 utility would be with the 911 board, um, I'm not certain that I can answer that without understanding what is envisioned in a 911 utility. Um, I did read the comments, but I think before I would comment on, on that further, I would really want to understand what it is that's being, being um, proposed or suggested. Okay, and you will be back after you? I will be back, I, uh, yes, as, as soon as I can. Okay, okay, just so that we can correspond that to when the discussion of the 911 utility comes up. Because I'm kind of curious what that after you given funds the E911 board? So it, the 911 board is funded through the Vermont Universal Service Fund, which I think everyone knows here is a 2% um, charge on your telecommunications bills, retail telecommunications sales. Um, we are one of se several programs that are funded through that, uh, and, and that is where our funding comes from exclusively, so there's no general funds or other funds involved. What, what does that money go to from the E91 board? So it, it goes for the um, the provision, if you will, of the system itself. So we have a um, contracted vendor that provides a 911 system in Vermont right now. That's Consolidated Communications, um, and that is a, a hefty chunk of the uh, yearly appropriation. Um, it also goes to cover the staff personnel costs of the 10 people at the 911 board. Um, work of the 911 board in, includes uh, information technology um, manager and specialists who work with the system provider and with the PSAPs to ensure everything is operating um, as expected and in accordance with the terms of the contract with the provider itself. And then there is a um, a uh, large percentage of the, well, about 40% of our staff is, uh, it does database work so that we have a sound GIS mapping, GIS data, which actually drives next generation 911 systems um, appropriately. We have training and communication staff and then administrative <coughs> support staff as well. Uh, so, so all of that, those personnel costs are covered there as well. And if I put you on the spot, I'm going to go over there. Um, but uh, again, I'm a little bit intrigued about the two ideas next to each other. I, I, I need to know what we all do. Um, and, and what you think about uh, where the E911 board might fit in resolving the, the concerns about power loss and the inability to access uh, E911 services. And what role from a consumer education perspective, mm -hmm. a technology perspective, uh, et cetera, I think that the board might play. Um, well, I would add at this point that uh, Act 79 requires that the 911 board um, initiate rulemaking for an outage notification procedure that would apply both to telecommunications, uh, both, let me agree more that, to voice service providers in Vermont as well as electric companies in Vermont for the purpose of assessing how uh, Vermonters are impacted by the various kinds of outages. And we're in the process of developing that rule now. We have not initiated the formal rulemaking. Um, it would be difficult for me to assess the impact of power outages on Vermonters' access to 911 without the data to understand how often 
these happen. Now, the data may be available elsewhere, and, and I can look into that. But, but um, at this point, I, I think that's the purpose of this rule, is to better understand the impacts from those power outages. And it sounds like it's a, it's a data-based resolution, or an attempt at a, at a database resolution to the problem of power losses uh, and the inability to access 911 when there are power losses. Right, right. And there are a number of factors involved, so we're just trying to look at when any specific company, when any specific service is down, how are the customers of that service impacted? So it may be the 911 system is likely still up and running. And so if a person has access to another type of telephone service, they may not be impacted. So it's not an all or nothing proposition. So um, that's what we're trying to get at with the, with the rule. So but the rule would provide even more understanding as to in a survey kind of fashion of, of uh, what happens in that circumstance and how and what may be good solutions to respond to. Right. I think understanding the scope of the problem is the first step in trying to figure okay. out how to solve it. So this what we're doing here is kind of complementary yes. to what, what you're doing. Yes. And on your other question about more detail perhaps of what the 911 board does, I'm happy to uh, answer the questions when I get back or compile something a bit more um, comprehensive perhaps to, to submit. Yeah, it would be very useful in the report mm -hmm. if, if, if you or the board were able to provide what, what your reflections are upon what the discussions that occurred in the workshop and if you could help answer the questions that the legislature um, has given us to answer. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I know. So I just <clears throat> want to add a point of clarification to what Ms. Neal said, and that's that the 2% surcharge on the telephone bill <clears throat> is not devoted exclusively to the 911 board, but it has a number of statutory purposes, including funding the connectivity fund for the Department of Public Service. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, with that, uh, who wants to make a presentation today? Jeff Austin, I consolidated. I, I figured we, we would go first. We're the incumbent local exchange carrier throughout most of Vermont, about cover about 200 towns here in Vermont. If you hadn't raised your hand, I would have pointed to Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> I figured we could start right off. Um, Please. But just, just a quick summary of our network in Vermont. I think uh, most people know um, we have a lot of fiber. We have about 3,800 miles of fiber here in Vermont today. But that fiber, um, it's distribution fiber, it's part of our ring network, it's part of the network that, that moves all of our traffic, a lot of our broadband. Um, our voice does go over that, but not on a fiber to the prem premises um, aspect. So we do have fiber delivered um, in two locations in South Burlington. Um, so I just kind of want to start knowing that our scope for the entire state, except for a couple of locations in South Burlington, is completely still copper serve. Um, for our residential telephone service. Uh, copper being line powered currently like it always has been line powered. Now we move though because there's a lot of focus obviously on increased broadband speeds. And the way you increase broadband speeds is you either get a lot closer with the electronics with the copper network, which we've done uh, in a lot of places, or you start delivering a new technology or different technology, fiber to the prem, which then gives you the ability to have um, one gig, 10 gig speeds, depending on what the electronics are on the end of that. And ultimately, what we're talking about today uh, with the battery backup. So Consolidated does, um, through the initial customer contact, if we do get a call from a customer in one of those locations, um, we do advise them uh, that their service will be provided over a fiber, uh, over fiber facilities, and that if there's a commercial power outage without an alternate power source, they will not have access to 911 service. Um, so following the FCC guidelines, we have that upfront conversation at the initial customer contact. Uh, we talk to them about, obviously, the options, where to find the information if they're interested in purchasing a battery backup. Uh, we advise them that we will send out a customer notice 
uh, which provides the other back of additional information to their billing address uh, within a couple days after that uh, initial order is placed. And that is basically the customer letter that we added in the comments that we had sent. And then annually, again, following the FCC rules, uh, we send a, a reminder notice that advises customers the same thing. And, and ultimately, what we're talking about here today, the initial uh, paragraphs of those notifications says you are served from a service that in a commercial power outage, you will not have dial tone unless you have a backup battery. So it's educational, uh, it's following the FCC guidelines. Uh, we don't have an impact yet here in Vermont, obviously, but we're moving toward that technology, so we will have an impact, and that's where we are today. Thank you. Are there questions for Consolidate? I have a question. Please. Um, Dr. Gibson. <coughs> Um, could you elaborate? I think you and I have had informal conversations, but could you elaborate just a little bit on the a part of your remarks that um, you could increase the, uh, the broadband speed to be increased by getting fiber a little closer to the end user? Sure. Yeah, yeah, there's, there, there's, some, there's some stations along the way or, or call center centers. Yeah, we in Vermont, we have about a thousand remote terminals. These remote terminals extend the intelligence of our central office further, and they're mostly fiber fed, further closer to our customers, ultimately allowing for increased broadband speeds the closer you are to those electronics. And even those electronics evolve. Um, our previous speed uh, maximum was. 7 meg, that's increased to 25 meg uh, download, 2 meg upload. That's now increased to 100 meg download, 40 meg upload, depending on the technology and the distance you are from those remote terminals. And these, these remote terminals are, are, are themselves fed by fiber optic, but they, from, from the terminal to the, to the home, is still copper? That is correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and these remote terminals are commercial, they're fed by commercial power. Um, we have battery backup in the remote terminals in case there's a commercial power outage. And for extended commercial power outages, each of the remote terminals has a portable generator connector. So you can deploy a portable generator, connect it, start it up. Um, those use, obviously, um, fuel. So you have to go out there and refuel them um, if it's an extended, extended commercial power outage. Uh, but that's, and then we can talk a lot more about that if you're interested, but that's well, just the, the one quick follow-up and then sure. I'm done. Uh, the, the, you said they're, they're, they're supported by batteries. What, what, can you describe those? Yeah, yeah, Remote they're, terminals? Uh, yeah, they're just actually, um, um, they're, they're just a battery packs, you know, battery strings uh, that are put together depending on the amount of electronics and amperage that the electronics use, uh, they're sized appropriately uh, for what's needed out there. Um, most of them, we have obviously some legacy technology, some newer technologies. If we have two different pieces of equipment, one for phone and one for internet, those batteries are powering the phone, you know, uh, electronics. If those electronics are combined, which is what we're using today, it's, it's powering both of those. For how long? Uh, those are between six and eight hours. Okay. Yes, sir. Chuck, can I ask a question about the line power, the copper? You, you, Consolidate has a lot of uh, residential customers in Vermont, the line powered service? Yes, yes, all of our copper network is line powered. Okay. And if, if you were to install fiber optic service to those residences, would you be required to remove the copper wire? Uh, there's no requirement to remove it, but then you get into the um, the, fine, the economics of maintaining two networks in the same area, and that's where it may be difficult. What we would probably do, and I'm just kind of just talking conversationally, is retire the copper that was up there. We would not remove it from the poles everywhere necessarily, uh, but we would want to only use and maintain one um, you know, one network, which ultimately can provide both uh, internet and voice services. But if there were uh, a loss of power mm -hmm. in in that situation when the fiber optic had been installed, that's that service would be interrupted with loss of power, while the line power service would not be. Without a, a separate power source, we're correct. Yep. Thank you. I'm sorry, but I'm reminded of. Uh, 
experience life in life. Uh, I lived in New Orleans for a couple of years, and, and uh, it was right after Hurricane Katrina. I was in the Coast Guard at the time. And on, on the weekends, I would go out and do, uh, every Saturday, I did Habitat for Humanity. And uh, I was working in a wonderful project called Musicians Village, where they redid a whole area of the ninth ward. And uh, they had to actually have special security available whenever they put uh, rewired home. Because uh, they put, they, they wire one of these wonderful new Habitat for Humanity homes, and if it wasn't secured uh, within a couple weeks, it no longer had anything up with it. Copper was gone. That's what the, I was thinking about retiring copper, and that's what just popped in my head. We've had those same issues of missing copper on poles or in developments. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, um, were there other questions for consolidating? You have one. Please. Um, does consolidated, um, what is, how does consolidated maintain the batteries? So the issue here is you know, in the in home batteries, the batteries go flat. Sure. People don't replace them or don't know to replace them. Um, so, but this is the responsibility of consolidated. Mm -hmm. How does consolidated manage um, the uh, the life of the battery and, the, and replacement of that battery? Yeah, uh, we have a maintenance uh, battery maintenance program uh, in uh, in all of the states that we have occupied. Uh, so, obviously, like I mentioned, we have a thousand about a thousand of these around the state. Um, so it's a continuous um, yearly project uh, that we have on a, like I said, year-over-year -year basis in all of our territories for battery maintenance. Um, and also, there's new technologies um, to allow batteries to actually last longer. You know, so there's always new developments and new technologies that we incorporate into our network uh, to actually give the batteries more of a, a longer lifespan. Just second up. Is the, do you, do you have the uh, sign up list? Um, I don't have it back yet. Can you pass that for a please? This makes it easier for her to write your name down. Excellent. I'm oh, sorry, sir. No problem. Um, I'm still Jonathan Gibson. <laughs> um, when your battery people go out, um, I don't know if you've been with them or not, but what, what do you expect they, what do they do to, to uh, maintain those batteries, the life and the replacement? And the you know, I don't know enough to be able to answer that problem in effective way. I think that's one of the issues, um, if I may, um, for the individual homeowner. Um, it is, you know, what you, I think it is communicated now um, in different ways um, by the telecom uh, to the to the to the, consu to the consumers. Certainly, a point of sale, and then annually, I think, in one form or another, um, that it's the homeowner's responsibility. Um, but what does that entail? Um, you, you could look at the light to see if it's blinking, but you might close the door in the closet or go up to the upstairs from your cellar and it would stop blinking. And and there's a warning, I think, that one might get. I know that some of the companies can, well, I, I don't know if all can or not. I really, really would be interested in knowing if, I know one of the, the Waitsfield company did mention this, and it certainly sticks in, in my mind that you are able to send a signal to see if the battery in a given location is, is, is functioning. Uh, doesn't necessarily say how much battery life is left, but is it is it working at that time? Um, so, I think this is one of the issues that we might want to talk about a little bit more: is what can the consumer do? What what what, what tools does the consumer have to effectively monitor uh, the status and to replace a battery, as compared, let's say, to a professional um, battery maintenance maintenance specialist? Um, I guess I would like to, uh, to circulate that question if, if we could. Please. Um, um, can all the companies that are offering cover services, or just one by one, can you identify the status of an individual consumer's battery at a, any given point in time? I know one of your RLX <coughs> said yes to that. 
Right. Volunteered so, that. Uh, yeah, I'll let Gordon speak about the detail of the situation. Sure, sure. Uh, but the Arlex um, are, are are also Ilex, the same as consolidated is in the bear incumbent carriers who have been serving in their respective service territories for uh, many, many years. Uh, they're, they're all in a slightly different situation, but the companies that are um, at, th at this point have fiber fed networks are Wakefield and Retail. Right. Uh, and they also happen to be the, the two largest of the RLX. Um, the smaller RLX um, have copper fed networks. And so, and, and in the case of Shoreham Telephone, which is over on the eastern shore of Lake Champlain, uh, over by Middlebury, <clears throat> they're transitioning to a fiber network. Um, but the other smaller companies, which are Topsum, um, the three TDS companies, and Franklin, um, so that's Ludlow, Northfield, Perkinsville, and then Franklin, um, are entirely copper fed uh, networks. And so they don't offer, pres they don't presently offer current services, uh, but they do have line power networks. In the case of Waitsfield, and I apologize that Roger Nishi's not here today, we had a, a death in his immediate family, and so he's traveling out of state. Um, what he has told me is, and, and this is seem a little ironic, I suppose, is that presently um, they do have the ability to monitor the batteries um, from the central office. Um, that's because of, na of the nature of the um, service they provide. As they upgrade at the, the speeds, um, the vendor is telling them that, that the higher speed uh, service it does not have remote sensors of the batteries. So as they swap those out over time, and, and they'll feel we'll be doing that increasingly, they're actually going to lose that functionality. So that's a, a, another instance, I think, of where these companies are really subject to the um, perils, if you will, of the marketplace, um, because they're reliant upon uh, vendors who are selling their equipment nationally and internationally, um, and they don't have a lot of influence over over the development of technology. Um, but for, for whatever reason, that particular functionality uh, will be going away over time. But, uh, and I, I, I know that's unfortunate. Um, and then in the case of uh, VTEL, I'll let Gordon Matthews, who's here, um, describe how VTEL's system operates. Yeah, we don't have the capability to monitor individual batteries and the status of an individual battery and the remaining capacity. We have the capability to monitor the status of an ONT, which is the unit that oh, the battery okay. powers okay. in an outage. So and we you can were tell if an ONT goes offline. We don't currently monitor that, monitor that on a network-wide basis. We're looking at setting up a system to do that because that's going to be, it looks like, one of the requirements for the E911 new reporting rules. So regardless of the reason for an ONT going offline, whether it's the problem with VTEL's network or it's due to a power outage, the provider will be required, it looks like, to report that to the 911 board. So that's going to require a, a separate monitoring system for all ONTs network-wide that we don't currently do. Were you, do you think Roger was referring to the outside device, the, the network uh, connection the uh, device, or was he referring to the battery inside the house, the distinction that uh, just been made? Do you happen to know? Uh, I, I don't know specifically. My impression was that he was referring to the battery. I thought, I thought that's, that's what he said earlier, but it might have been uh, something connected to the battery, which is what you're referring to. Correct. Yeah, that, that's at an individual house, if, if necessary. Somebody called in and said, I'm not, I'm not getting service, no, you, could, you could check it from your office if the, if the NID or ONT device right. is functional. Correct. Retail could. Yes. So, yeah. uh, Chuck Finberg again. Rob, in uh, regard to what Mr. Matthews was saying, I'm a Vermontel customer. Um, we had an episode in our house earlier this summer where uh, all power, all service was lost uh, to from the VTEL service, so we had nothing. Um, no phone, no internet, no television, and no notification. We were not aware of the outage. So I was, I had to go, without cell service, I had to go down to Brook to uh, Rutland to contact VTEL. Luckily, it was not during the hours when their service department is closed, which is Saturday noon through Sunday. Um, and when I spoke to the gentleman there, um, 
what he said was that they can tell whether there's an outage at a, at a residence. Um, but, um, and he checked and saw that there was no power, but they had no protocol for reaching out or for us providing service or repair when they saw that. They didn't have any monitoring in place. So that's, that's what this service technician or the person in the office said, that it seemed like a, a hole to me in the, in the uh, process when you don't even know that your 911 service is out. I guess we'll continue with our survey around. Oh, ma'am, you had a question. Hi, John. Okay. I'm sorry, who, who was it that spoke? I didn't see. I'm sorry, what's your name? Cecile. Cecile, what's your last name? Beatty. You just Cecile spoke? Beatty. I'm probably the last person on your list. Oh, no. Okay, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, uh, oh, I'm happy to continue if you want. Please. Yeah. Um, so uh, we filed our comments um, last week um, just to emphasize that we are, are presently in compliance with the FCC rules. Um, we did provide um, a, a chart, um, which was basically a survey of the companies uh, because in, in, uh, in each case, each company provides a little bit more than what the FCC uh, requires, strictly speaking, and so this is a list of additional or ancillary services that are related to backup power that the companies provide. And in our discussion as a group, even though not all companies presently provide each of those services, we decided that those were uh, a, a good list of what we would consider to be current practices or best practices that the companies are willing to provide um, you know, comprehensively among the group. Um, if that's what the PUC's uh, wish is. And so um, <clears throat> we can review those, but I think they fall um, into a general category, which is that um, there's, there, there are ways that the end user, the customer, can extend the life of the battery. And uh, we would like to um, engage in additional educational efforts to alert the customers for how they can take their eight or 24 hour battery packs um, and use them most efficiently, use them most wisely in a way that extends their battery life um, so that if there is an extended outage that lasts greater than 24 hours, um, they would still have the ability to uh, use their voice services for however long the battery pack uh, can last. Uh, and that's uh, a focus that we'd like, to, we'd like the commission to consider uh, because I think it's a, it's a good, efficient way of using current technologies and current education efforts um, to address what I hear to be the real core problem here, which is that these outages are getting more extended in time. And so it's, it's necessary for customers to have access to their voice services for longer periods of time. Um, which brings to mind to me uh, one of the things I was going to suggest that, that the participants do for the next meeting, uh, which is to review the uh, best practices that have been uh, proposed by in the various packages that were submitted and to comment upon them, uh, if you think they're good ideas or not and why, because uh, uh, that'll be part of uh, what the commission will consider when it, it forwards its report. So, but I, I won't ask for that today. I'm just asking, I'm saying that now, so you can take notes while people are talking if it helps you figure out if you like the thing or not. Question? Just a second, please. So that would be part of the uh, initial comments and reply comments that you anticipate we will do that we'll file after the October workshop? No, I will, I will probably mark them for the October workshop for the October. so that we can talk about them there to a greater degree possible. My question was then, uh, would that best practices list include the the um, CSRIC uh, list that Sarah was kind enough to refer yes, to? Yes, absolutely. I, 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 I want to include those documents in the report uh, so that the uh, legislature can see that the FCC has addressed the issue before in a more comprehensive fashion. And the measures that we reviewed and that we've um, offered and compiled into that chart, um, to a large measure, come from the CSRIC report. Um, and we also included an element um, 
which, which we thought was interesting, that the that CSRIC um, felt there was some obligation on the part of local authorities um, to step up and um, take some responsibility for um, either um, warehousing batteries or just in, in, in some measure um, providing a resource for their, for, their, for their residents and their communities. Understanding, of course, that in each case these CSRIC uh, recommendations are are not mandatory. The FCC wants them to be voluntary, but they are ideas. Uh, they are ideas, they're and, and they've been tested by uh, working with the federal right. That's yeah. some expertise in these matters. Yeah. Right. If I may, again, to, to to that point, and this is the time to add this to the record. I mean, it's perhaps the FCC order and report are by reference already part of the record. I don't know. I'd like for them to be. People can, can access that. But with respect to that uh, CSER recommendation, um, the, in, I believe it's in paragraph 60, if I'm not misquoting this. <laughs> I could stand corrected. But there's a footnote, number 194, that the paragraph is dealing with the um, information to consumers, information requirements. Um, and the footnote says, we, uh, that's the FCC, we emphasize that this information establishes a floor only and does not supplant the ability of states, to the extent they have jurisdiction over the service, to adopt additional obligations that do not prevent implementation of our rules. I think it's just important that the Commission itself says that um, they recognize that while they did not adopt all the CSER, um Best practice recommendations in this instance with regard to information that they don't they don't state to the extent that the state has jurisdiction. Exactly. Yes. Good point. But again, uh, capture that in your written comments and they're gonna go in a report. I, although I appreciate your stating them now before the rest of Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Phillips, we all set. Um, I, well, I appreciate Mr. Gibson's reference to that footnote. I'm just looking at it here, <clears throat> and the information that the FCC is talking about is not the CSRIC recommendations. It's actually the um, what they call the minimum information requirements oh, that okay. they're adopting as part of the FCC's rule. Thank you. Um, and it was, it was in that spirit of, of a floor that we um, compiled this list, which are additional educational requirements on top of what the FCC is requiring. May, may I ask, in, in response to that, are, are you suggesting that uh, additional best practices could not be adopted by a state? Um, I, I'm not making a legal determination about that. I'll give you the legal answer, which is pets. And it can be done. It's hard to make a blanket answer to that question, but by the nature of the company that's involved uh, in the technology that's involved. Uh, and there's, there's great uncertainty in the, in the law as well uh, in terms of the role of Short question. You mentioned something about the communities taking responsibility for backup batteries for the residents. Could you sort of speak a little further to that? Being a select board member, I'm right, wondering sure. if you're talking about uh, local governments taking on some responsibility well, I, there, or what? what right. I mean, uh, if, if I could, and if you want to look it up, go ahead, because yeah. I have thoughts on this as well. That, that uh, yes. Uh, that this is a public health issue, not necessarily to make telecommunications issue. And there's a very real role that uh, local emergency services play. Uh, you know, I have a, I have a, a son-in-law to be who uh, is a paramedic uh, up in Memorial County. And uh, when my fiance and I bought our house, he said, oh, I've been there many times mm. because the people who lived there before were elderly. So there, there is an understanding that local uh, fire departments, EMSs, paramedics, et cetera, have as to uh, the folks who should be uh, cared about 
and then there is a power loss, and that's a, I'm not sure how to how to how to you know fit those things into a machine, uh, what the protocol should be. But I think there's a very there's a lot of knowledge there, and a lot of local knowledge there that can play a role in fitting some of these gaps, and that's I think what the CSRC reports referring to as well. So this, the specific reference that I was making was to the CSRC recommendations from September 2014 the best practices list and their new best practice number seven which is on page 21 and 23 um, is and I'll just quote it uh, local public safety officials should create disaster response plans that include plans for backup battery supplies in the same way they have plans for food water and fuel during power outages and, unquote. and so that's just uh, one of the recommendations that they've made, which we thought was intriguing, along with some of the other ones that we picked up on uh, in our chart. Yes, ma'am. Sir, what is the cost of this to, like, an individual? And they're already paying for a service, and they had a service that they relied on, and now they picked up all of these responsibilities. Um, and I'm hearing that they're supposed to pay for them. Well, the FCC, right, the FCC requires only that the companies offer for purchase by the customer these battery pack, packs, uh, or we can recommend outside vendors okay. that they can go to. Okay, so there's somewhere along the way, the contractual base for the customer is now shifted. Whereas what was being provided before that we assumed was going to happen um, has now shifted somewhat. And so the customer now has more responsibility to maintain that service. Well, I'm not sure I would agree that the contractual uh, relationship has shifted. I mean, what, what, so what's happened is that a, a, what used to be a standalone voice service that was offered over a copper-fed, line-powered line um, that was just voice service has been essentially replaced by a much larger bundle of services that includes voice, but also includes video and data, substantial amounts of data. And the power that's required to fund those additional services is more than a copper-fed line can, can be. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm understanding that. Right. On the other hand, that basic piece was the light was the connection to the world in a sense um, for emergencies mm -hmm. for family and whatever and and as these other things became <coughs> more important to all of us I think many of us did not recognize the cost <coughs> for our safety and security you know, like I, I rent an outside, I mean, I paid VTEL for it since 1970s for this outside service, you know, line business. Um, and just for that reason. And as I'm talking to people in town, I'm becoming more and more aware that most of us really do not understand what happened to us. Uh, it's a little bit like going into surgery and, uh, right, right. and not fully understanding yeah. the fine print. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not the policymaker here. I'm simply I the, <laughs> I representing the companies that do this. And, and, the, and, and so I will say that, it, I mean, I represent landline companies who've been offering service for 100 plus years. Um, and, and certainly we were aware as competition came along and it was fiber fed service and it was a very robust service and um, my clients were having to compete that, that there were going to be some technological changes. And so from, from my own standpoint, you know, I said to my wife, we're not giving up our landline. That's our, that's our, that's the line that stays in, in power when the power goes out. We happen to live in a rural community where the power goes out with some frequency. Um, so we, we were aware of that only because, I guess, of the nature of my work and the fact that I knew this technology was changing. But the FCC, you know, which was kind of guiding this process, 
um, has, has been a, attempting to keep people apprised and, and put out notices for you know five plus years. Um, and, and I certainly understand and appreciate from the end user perspective that you know you're sort of the last one to hear about it. But at the same time, as I as I sit here, I recognize that you and I are not unique. How many thousands of people in, in, in Vermont are affected? How many nationally? And do we continue to wring our hands, or do we challenge those wonderful technical people to fix it for us mm -hmm. to develop that next stage? Right. <clears throat> well, I, mean, I, I do want to say from the small company's perspective, and this was reflected in our comments as well, um, that, that my clients, the small companies, have been under tremendous pressure over the last many years from the state and from the federal government to convert their networks yeah. and to replace the copper networks. And, you know, I guess the, the good news is they didn't do it so quickly that we're not sitting here with entirely fiber effect networks. I mean, it's sort of ironic that now the copper network is, is considered this gold standard when it's been... Across the street, it has been. I mean, if you if you got if you talk to the legislators about about finding funds in the in the high cost fund to maintain the existing networks, you'd be laughed out of the building because they literally tell you to your face that they're not funding old technology. And I have been laughed. And you've not building. Been it's yeah. happened. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I appreciate yes, ma'am. I, I appreciate your concern, yeah. and and again, I I, I feel compelled talk about cars and how when you get in a car, uh, I, I have a friend who owns a Tesla, and we were traveling the last two days, and his Tesla was parked in a lot on over here, and he could pick up his phone and tell me how much electricity, was, how much battery power was available in that car. Okay. Then I think of my grandparents, who on their 50th anniversary drove up to the reception in a Model T. And the difference between what's in that Model T as a piece of technology and what's in that Tesla and how huge that difference is. And, and it's hard to point a finger at somebody and say, who's responsible for that? Now I guess we sort of all are, because we like, you know, Tesla's have duties, you know, we, we like the Model T when it came out. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a, it's just moving with the pace of society. Um, and I appreciate the concern of, well, there's a gap here, we need to fill it. And that's why I was really encouraged by the lady from Enoch, from Ms. Ms. Neal, talking about how they're going to do a sort of comprehensive survey that will provide data that will show where gaps are. So I think that goes to your other question. But in terms of who pays, it's always going to be the consumer, because the consumer is the one that's buying that service. You know, you could live off grid and not have anything at all, and you wouldn't have to pay. But if you want to be able to get to that EMS service, you're going to have to buy something. You're going to have to pay for some kind of a, of a linkage to do that. And, and, and in Wallingford, the question is, you know, the, the select board has indicated it does not really think that the consumer should be paying. And I, 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 I don't know what that is. Okay. On the other hand, there is no figure um, of approximately how much people. Absolutely. And, and that, I mean, it's and that, hard to quantify. It's those unknowns that and in I, terms of I think that what, what Ms. Neal is talking about developing will provide great. a greater snapshot into what the gaps are, and then from that can be developed a dollar figure that she may have to pay for as part of the 911 board's desire to deliver 911 services uh, comprehensively. She may not. It may, it may be beyond what they do. But she may be able to come up with that right now that just, you know, Mr. Phillips doesn't know the answer to that question, and I don't know the answer to that question, yeah. although it's a very good question. <laughs> and, and we are participating actively in the 911 board rulemaking. But I do want to say, because it's reflected in our comments, that the point at which the FCC um, first established the backup power requirement. The, the, the clients that I represent um, offered that eight hours of backup power for no charge. They were, they were willing to do that as a service for their customer, understanding that um, this was a new, a new development and wrinkle, but it was something that the co company was willing to offer. And it was only at the point that the 
the FCC rule changed this past spring to require 24 hours of backup power, that they said, well, that's a greater cost than we can bear. So as our comments reflect, um, the companies are still willing to provide that first eight hours of backup power at, at no charge, uh, but it's the additional 16 plus hours uh, that will have a charge. What, what brought me to Montpelier last April was the fact that there are many people in, in rural areas where there's no redundancy of service, there's not cell phone and, and copper wire, cell, cell phone and fiber, was that there are people who have lifeline phone service. They can't afford the kind of services that we're talking about here. There are people who have um, disabilities and maladies that need reliable service. They need to be reached by 911. Um, and they need to, when there are emergencies from the outside, and they need to be able to reach 911, and they can't bear these interruptions, and they can't afford to go buy replacement batteries for $120 or, or more, and they don't really have the means to monitor um, um, the, the gradual weaknesses of the battery. So the best practices that, um, that you'd like us to address in, in after the session, I think, are really worth going through in detail. But we haven't talked about, I mean, funding has to take into account people who, who need, who, who can't afford to do it themselves. Some of us can, can buy generators. What, what's going to happen? And when I came to, uh, to Montpelier in April, I said, you, you have to ask whether even a 24-hour set of batteries is an adequate replacement for the uninterrupted E911 access that copper wire phones provided. This is a gaping, dangerous hole in the phone service that substitution of fiber optic wire for phone service has caused. And while expansion of robust internet service to rural areas throughout Vermont is admirable, expending large sums of taxpayer subsidies upon this expansion without simultaneously assuring preservation of access to E911 service is inviting tragedy to occur down the road. So but the, the message I, I come to, to you today, sir, is uh, that, that I think you're going to be um, digesting and synthesizing for the PUC to report back to the legislature in, in Act 79, as, as it asks you to do, is th there's a there's a tragedy waiting down the road if there's interrupted E911 service. And um, expanding for business reasons and for um, the education of children in rural areas, they're, they're great ideals, but they can't be implemented at the loss of robust E911 service for people who can't afford it and for people who need it most. Thank you. Uh, just one follow-up comment, just because just I want to kind of bring this down a couple other couple of levels, is whether you're talking copper or fiber, and I think we talked about this last time, there is always an opportunity that something's going to happen that will affect 911 service. So I, obviously, their conversation here is related to fiber and minimizing those effects. Um, but I just kind of want to make sure that everybody understands that whether it's a snowstorm, car accident, it could be, you know, if somebody digs something up, stuff you know, happens. stuff happens. And we want to minimize that. And we work all, we all work very hard to minimize that. But the reality is there's always that potential. But at the same time, that doesn't mean we shouldn't attempt to address this, <clears throat> this hole that technology and the, the spur of the change in technology has created. And the FCC has sought to address it. That's what the CSRIC kind of represents. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it anymore. But when we do talk about it, we need to talk about it recognizing that it's been talked about before and there are still holes. Because that's a piece of data that's important as well. So. So. That's a good point. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen three minutes from now. You know, the East Coast, we're just going to go out because of a, some sort of cyber terrorism. You know, we don't know that. And that's about it. I'd like to get back to what we can't. I'd like to, to, to bring down to what we can do. And, and I would say that I, Mr. Phillips was kind enough to respond to the question about could their systems um, uh, identify the status of a battery or of an external um, 
terminal. Uh, I didn't, we didn't hear from you. Right, and I think what I'd like to do is, if Mr. Phillips is finished with his overall presentation, ask the other presenters to address that in their discussion. I'm, I'm fine. I'm done. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah. I'm not stopping it. No, no. But I'd rather than just answering that question now, that we would allow folks to do what their presentation was sure. and, 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 and address that as well as part of it. And could I, there's a question that I'd like to add to that just so we can maybe process a few of these sure. things if you think it's a legitimate question. And if they miss it, don't, don't be afraid to ask them. I won't. Um, <laughs> mention has been made of the cost. The FCC talked about a, a balancing. Of cost. Now, the Vermont legislature did not talk about a balancing. You might assume that they would consider cost as well as effectiveness in, in minimizing disruption, but they didn't explicitly charge these best practices with a cost um, filter. But that is something that the commission thinks about. Too. The commission does in its own, on its own right to do so, and appropriately. Um, it was called to my attention that. In my annual, in my monthly bill to my uh, provider, I have a, a number of instances in different categories of something called the regulatory recovery fee, and it's not inconsequential. There's a 550 item, there's a 26 cent item. It may appear at other times. I'm not sure which is which, but the apparently the definition of a regulatory recovery fee is. Something that is used to quote, def, used to defray rising costs associated with compliance with governmental regulations and programs. This assessment will ensure that we provide, or we the or the utilities provide, greater accessibility to our services in accordance with the state and federal law. So the fee varies by service. Um, so here's a fee that is not a tax that's passed on. It doesn't go to the Vermont uh, Service Fund. It's, it's retained by the companies. So my question would be, what, what are those monies used for? Are they fully used? And what is the constraint that would prevent their being used to step up some of the um, 911 continuity requests that the towns and citizen, individual citizens have, have made? So it's a, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think we can get into a detailed analysis of no, every item in the bill. You're looking for money, too. I'm looking for money. Yeah. Okay, and here's a charge that's to comply with federal regulations. Now, maybe it's exhausted by complying with the 2015 order and there's zero money left. But it is in the pockets uh, paid by the consumers of the, or in the, in the accounts, excuse me, of the, um, of the telecommunication company, so I'm, I'm wondering if we could get a little shed a little light on whether that 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 source of revenue might be to some extent devoted to these to the parties. extent folks are familiar with it and are able to answer that question. I've not seen the, the bill. I don't know what the charges are for, what the rate is, or anything like that. Right. I'm, I'm not familiar with that charge. Um, I will say that I represent eight different companies that have eight different billing systems. Uh, five different billing systems because CBS has three companies. Um, I mean, I, I'd ask Gordon if he has any familiarity with that at all. I wouldn't be able to tell you right off the top of my head exactly how that breaks down, what it's used for, and to the extent it could be used for this particular I mean, it, it appears every month, and the company is one of your clients. And, and, and so Maybe what we'll do, sir, I think it's a good question. It's, it's, it's a fund that I, I've never participated in a telecommunications rate proceeding, so I can't say no, that either. Um, and, unless somebody else here can provide a general answer to that, maybe what we'll do is in, in your filings for the prior to the next workshop, we'll ask to answer that question. What is that, what is that fee for, and could it be used? In any way to, uh, if, if in fact it's something that all the all the telecommunication providers uh, do charge of the consumers, whether it could be used to uh, to fund batteries for battery backup. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be helpful in this context if Mr. Gibson would give us a copy of that, so we, we could talk to yeah. the people back at the company who no, actually do that. No, no, I have, I, have to, I mean, I brought it uh, for this reason because I'm curious. I mean, we are. Does, does anybody know what that charge is for? Separate from the subscriber. It's called the it's called the regulatory recovery fee. I think it's a fairly standard thing, but I only I only deal with one. Just one for a problem. general answer, if yeah, if you don't, that's fine, sir. I, I can say the different companies 
collect money under that rubric for different purposes. That some of them collect their universal service fees under that. Some of them collect fees to serve their staff who have to file multiple FCC forms. And some of them, I dare say, may not spend it all on regulatory recovery. And I don't know which companies are which. Um, I know our company doesn't charge any of those. But um, I don't think there is an answer to that question. Okay. It's, it's a broad category that people use in different ways. Yeah. But it could conceivably fit paying for backup batteries, given the fact that it could, doesn't have any other definition. So to find the money, you can either raise your rates or create little fees right. or pass it on to government. But one way or another, the money is yeah. going to be found, and it's going to be named whatever way everyone wants to or unless we're directed to. Right. Mm -hmm. At one point, the FCC does have um, some consumer information on, on how to uh, read a uh, telephone bill, subscriber bill. Um, I believe that they have a definition of regulatory recovery charge. So I think it is something that uh, most all telephone companies charge. Yes, ma'am. Um, we're talking about the cost of the backup batteries here, and it seems to me there's just been a, a real cost shift here. You know, um, uh, following up on what Cecile said, and Jonathan and Chuck as well, um, we used to pay our phone bill, and the phone would work. Now we have to pay our phone bill, and if there's a power outage, we have to pay for a backup battery. And maybe if we have eight, we might have eight hours. And if we want more than that, we have to pay an additional charge, you know, for 24 hours, for 36 hours, whatever it may be. And it's falling, I think, very unfairly on the consumer. Being a, you know, a small rural town in Vermont, where most of our residents do not have deep pockets, it's like, why is this cost for service um, that is supposed to be provided? I mean, I think the model for the telephone companies is to provide telephone service, and yet it's not the service that's being provided without this charge and this charge and this charge. And somehow there's, there is, as we've said before, there's got to be a balance there as to what is falling very unfairly, I think, on, on customers for these charges, or now perhaps on um, first responders or on communities. It seems to me and some of those charges really do belong with the uh, telecommunications companies. Okay, well, we're not going to resolve this issue. I, I just wanted to put my two cents and I, and I'm work. thinking about my friend's, <laughs> my friend's Tesla. And how that Tesla has cameras on it so that he can see if there's somebody around his car. Uh, it has it has you know, it has that app so that he can know exactly where his car is and see everybody around his car. Um, those are consumer products that he was willing to pay for with the growth of technology. And um, you know he can't buy a Model T. Uh, you know you can't buy a car with a with a crank down window anymore. You can't buy a car with a. Uh, a knobby radio. Um, you can't buy a car without a GPS practically anymore. So, you know, it's it's kind of, it, it's an industry function that it's, you really have a hard, you know, is it the consumer's fault, is it the company's fault, or is it just the pace of history's fault? Uh, it's a hard question to really resolve, and we're not going to resolve it. Here. It's a good question to ask. I, I would like to just, I would just add that, that there's another player in the mix, which is the regulatory agencies, because this is not simply a market-based service. I mean, it's a competitive service, but in the case of my clients, um, they're all uh, designated as eligible telecommunications carriers, which means that they're carriers of last resort. They have to serve every customer who comes to them seeking service. Um, they do receive federal universal service funding for that privilege. Um, which they greatly appreciate, but the amount of that funding has, got, has declined significantly. And along with the decline in the revenue stream from the federal pools um, has been a concomitant substantial increase in the regulatory obligations. And so as part of an ETC designation, now you, you are required to provide broadband as one of the supported services. And so you're no longer 
you know, able to just provide the voice service that you used to provide. You have to provide the broadband along with it. And, and as I said before, you know, we're not, we're just, we're simply the companies that use the technology. We're not the inventors and the designers of it. Um, and, uh, you know, this technology comes with, you know, with vendors and with equipment providers and all that. Um, I, I would also just add that, you know, looking statewide, I mean, there are communities that would absolutely kill for the kind of services that your towns get. And, and, and maybe they're not aware of the backup power obligation, but they are aware of the, of the, of the speed of the broadband that you have, and, they, and, and what they're looking at is broadband as, and, and high-speed broadband as an economic development force that raises property values in towns, that creates jobs in those towns, that allows people to relocate and work from home. And so there are tremendous economic benefits that come to the communities along with the broadband. So I, I understand that you feel as though it's an unfair burden that you're bearing for the back of power, but what you're receiving is something that other towns are salivating. Well, I have two points there. I think a lot of people did not understand right. that their phone was not going to work when the power was out for an extended period of time. And I think that is almost universal from people I've spoken with. They did not realize during prolonged power outages, my phone was not going to work. Um, so I think there really is a need for greater education along those lines. My other thing is just the cost shift. You know, we all welcome uh, faster internet. You know greater broadband speed. That's all wonderful. And I understand everything you're saying. I think um, my concern is just the fact that suddenly if you do want to use that phone, you're going to pay, have to pay an additional charge for it. It's not just phone service any longer. And then it falls on the consumer, solely on the consumer. Yes, ma'am. The Tesla still goes and it stops. OK? The Model T went and it stopped. What we are working toward here, it seems, is a both and. We are not really wanting a world of either or. And I think that is the dilemma, is how do we create good things and somehow maintain the quality of life or safety or security that we have. Every corporation in America is working on safety. And the fact that we at home now have so easily let that go is a real surprise. Uh, and because we're not paying workers' comp, I guess we, we, we're not expected to notice. But, but I think that the conversation of compliance and new technology and is, is really a red earring at the level of the both and. I'm sorry, nobody level, wants I'm sorry, the level of what? Of both and. Both and. Thank you. We're really wanting both. And, we, and maybe some people would say it's having our cake and eating it too. But we know that technically we've been able to do many things that way. I, the, the difficult question, the question you said was so difficult to answer about finances. I, I think, per, perhaps you already know this, but the person who's, who's been asked to answer that question first is you. And the, the act said, uh, recommend best practices for minimizing dis, disruptions to E911 services during power outages through technical and financial assistance to consumers and communities. So I think it's within the scope of this assignment to address questions like how do we, that's where we're talking about, how do we fund services, how do we fund um, providing. I'm not denying it. No. I think, I mean, that's the challenge. I don't know that I'll answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think I should. Uh, because that's not within the authority of what I can, what the commission even necessarily can do. But, but we can propose possibilities. They're, they're asking for, for the recommended best practices, for, and we can see what some needs are, what some holes are. And that's why I was interested it. in this regulatory servicing fund. Sir. Quick comment. I, I, I'm, just, I'm not sure if Mrs. Beatty um, meant it, but I thought I heard looking for a 
technical solution. And as long as we're using paraffin fibers of glass to deliver the voice back and forth, there is no way to deliver power to those devices. And I think you knew that, but I just want to make sure that it's clear to everyone in the room that the only solution is to provide power at the other end. It's not going to come from the power company during an outage, and it won't come from the communications company because there's no conductor of power to the other end. So it has to be a battery or a generator or solar or something like that. And so the technical solution is beyond our grasp when the copper wires are taken away and not powered anymore. Yeah. Unless there's another form. So, so could where the, where the wires are not taken away and where there's not cell service in a rural community and where there's a demand for and provision of a good internet broadband services. Could, is it technically possible for the, I'm not supposed to be prepared for all non-technicians, I certainly am a non-technician, but is it possible that the remaining retained copper copper wire, or let us say that which was pulled but could be re returned in, in in specific instances, could go to a, a call station. Uh, I, I, I don't know how these um, uh, micro cell things on poles are supposed to work. Maybe they extend cell coverage where there's not good cell coverage. That's that's one solution that's been proposed. And in fact, the legislation talks about micro cells and getting them out of warehouses and around the state. And, and the communities have been sent letters, I think, by the department. You can confirm this or, or correct it, saying, you know, there are some of these uh, devices that if your community would like to locate some and propose to, to uh, obtain them, we should pursue that. But my question is more about uh, you know the telephones that are beside the road for for, for, for motorists. Is it possible to have some uh, as a, as a maybe as an only an interim as a short term thing, but a, a place where someone can go and make a phone call uh, that is that is powered by you know near a near a near a uh, what are the field stations that you were field offices whatever what do we term remote terminal no, yeah the remote terminals. Um, Near, near one of those, or with a line that's that's been retired, but is still there, they can be connected to a simple phone box where somebody can go if they really need to get get the fire department to come and they can't reach them. I mean, I, I, that's a that's a is that a technical fix or is it just too preposterous and and uh, and, and far out to, to, to work? I know that copper wires on eventually. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean. Technically, you can put a phone out there, if, but if you're, if it's an emergency situation, you have to drive two miles. To yeah, the well, uh, that's the problem with this. I mean, it was proposed to me to ask the question, right? And I thought, well, if your house is burning down or if you're lying on the floor with a heart, heart, a, a stroke, you're not going to jump in your car and go even a quarter mile. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's where the EMS, where my son-in-law drives there because he knows there's somebody who might have that problem with and just checks on. Right. part of the emergency response plan instead of relying upon a technology to do it. Maybe. Sir. So I, I would like to hear from the fiber companies that have yes. never had circuit switch networks. Mm -hmm. Because as we know from the E911 board. I, I have been allowing the questions. Yeah. But I do want to get, I want to get back into the cycle here. That's where 80% of the 911 calls in the state originally. So uh, I think it's important to hear from them. Absolutely. And we can do that now, please. Okay, uh, I'm Jim White from Comcast, and uh, we made a very lengthy filing about our current practices. It uh, shows the information we give customers, the acknowledgments they give, what's available on our website. You know, we give customers lots and lots of information about our service and limitations in the event of a power outage. So, just from the beginning, we're an interconnected VoIP provider, but we're an alternative provider. We've never been line powered. So from the very beginning, um, it was clear to, you know, that uh, for the preservation of 911 service during a power outage, that there would need to be a battery in the home. Now we start out with, right from the beginning, when we sell a new customer voice service, 
by federal regulation, they have to complete an E911 acknowledgement. And that's in paragraph 15 in our filing, and it mentions the fact that there's a limitation during a power outage, and you might need a battery backup. That's step one. If, if the customer does not complete that acknowledgement, the order will not flow through. It will not flow through. The next thing happens is we have a battery disclosure statement, and it's attachment A. In our filing, again, it's very clear that there are limitations during the power outage. Um, once the service is, well, once a customer gets the voice service, many of these are now self-installed kits. You, you get a modem, and you can provision it yourself. Usually with your cell phone, there are a few steps you can do this. You get a welcome kit. The welcome kit, there's a snapshot from a welcome kit. There's a very clear statement in there about backup batteries. In addition, the modem, the modem comes with a battery sticker. And this really goes back to 2005, when Vonage was one of the first internet voice providers. And all of a sudden, I think people at the time were unclear about the limitations of calling 911, perhaps. You know? um, and the FCC required battery stickers. So along with, um, all, these are just stickers that come along with the service. So when, when the self-install kit comes, here comes the sticker as well. Um, right now, what we've done, is, over the past, there have been many different kinds of modems. As we upgrade our technology and upgrade our speeds, we change the technology of our modems. So we had a number of different kinds of modems, each with different types of batteries. What Comcast did when the 24-hour requirement came out is we now move to one battery, one 24-hour battery, and one type of modem. So now that the battery is depleted, um, or if a customer calls in and wants, uh, wants a battery, what they get is Comcast Advanced X, it's called X-Fire. We, uh, pro, uh, we uh, saw our products under Xfinity, so x is our advanced gateway or modem. Um, they get that, and they get a, a battery specifically designed for that modem. It looks like Mr. Phillips' adapter that's connected to a laptop. It doesn't get inserted into the modem. It's an external battery, and there's a picture of it in our filing, so it's it looks it's a little bigger than the adapter going to Mr. Phillips' laptop, and everybody knows what that, those look like. So it's it's not everyone understands how to plug it in, plug it into the laptop or your modem, and you, and you plug it into the wall. Um, so we also give an annual notice, and there's a sample in our filing, very clear annual notice about limitations of backup battery. We have lots of information on our website, for example. And we attach these, for example, as one, how to stay connected during storms. There's one on what is E911 service, what does it mean? And we have additional information, such as um, if you have a cordless phone that may not work in a power, it's not going to work in a power outage, we advise you to have a corded phone. We advise you to have a, um, a, a cell phone as well. And we, these, this, the multiple links in our filing about the information we give customers. So now, in addition um, to Mr. Gibson's question, we do monitor. We do monitor. Um, we do call customers when the battery is nearing, is depleted or nearing depletion. We do that with a phone call. Let me just back up a little bit. After all this notice, the take rate for batteries is less than 1%. And when we call customers, I hate to say it now, during this world of spam, almost none of our calls are answered, and it doesn't tend to generate any, very, very few, requests for batteries. This is a call that says what? Our calls when we, when we call customers that your battery's depleted. Uh, is it when you're is it, is it, is it They don't answer the phone, and most of the time they do, we leave a message. Your battery's near depletion. It does not generate a response. And it, it, some do. I'm not going to say none, but it just does not generate. You said less than 1%. Well, the 1% take batteries. I'm not from the initial offering. I'm not sure what the percentage is of those when the battery's depleted. Uh, so, um, we understand the um, position of the, of the talents. Um, and 
you know, I, I think there's a certain element of that the technology has just changed. If you look at the number of customers now taking basic phone service, you know, from consolidated the IP periods, 60% or 50%, I don't know what it was 10 years ago. I mean, it's, there's a, there's a decline. In the, so many more people are shifting to cell phone service. So Comcast, we have a fair number of voice subscribers. Those are declining. You know, I'm not going to tell you exact name, and we have, but with those are declining as well. More and more people are going to internet and cell phone. And um, it's just kind of a, a, a change in life, um, a change in technology, change in the era. Uh, but um, we feel that we're compliant. We, you know, we feel that we you know, do a good job of trying to inform customers of the limitations of our service. Um, and uh, you know, we, we noted, in fact, that the, the Vermont DPS website has information on VoIP. It has a couple links on the limitations of VoIP. The FCC has that. I believe even I wouldn't, without Barbara here, I wouldn't want to confirm this necessarily, but even the E911 board, I think, might even have a little squib about VoIP on it. So um, with, with, with respect to costs, um, one thing the, the FCC said is that uh, it found in its order is that recognizing that someone's going to pay for this. You know, one way or another, in the end, I mean, hate to say it does sound mercenary, but in, in the end, customers do pay one way or another through their, through their charges and fees somehow. It's just the way businesses operate. So, but if a customer doesn't want a battery, should they pay for those who do? I mean, that was one point. I'm just throwing that out. There's one point that the FCC made, and that they didn't want to impose that on everyone. Now, Comcast, we're not an ETC, uh, but we do pay into the Universal Service Fund. So our customers are contributing to 911 relay service, connectivity fund, and things like that. So um, that's basically our presentation. Um, Thank you. Nice. Take questions. A couple of questions. Um, well, for one thing, we're a small rural town. We don't have cell service. I think that's one of our great concerns about the fact that, you know, we sit, sit along the spine of the Green Mountains. We, we get horrendous storms going through there, and the power goes out. And I do have to say, as far as, well, it used to be CBPS, now GMP, you know, they've really done a lot to minimize those power outages. I mean, it used to go out quite frequently and for days at a time. And that has been substantially reduced, and we're most grateful, especially because we don't have cell service. It's not an option for us at the moment. So we are very dependent upon that phone line, especially when the weather's bad during those um, power outages. Um, and I wish it was an option for our residents to, to, to just have that cell phone. Um, I'm just wondering, your batteries, how long do your battery backups, the backup batteries last, the ones you Well, it's 24 hours if, if you talked on it for two or three hours and drained the battery down. It would, I'm not exactly sure how quickly it would, um, would drain, but it would provide up to 24, it's up to 24 hours. And our website advises people to limit you know, calling to non uh, limit your non-essential calls, you know, things like that. There's information about that on the website. Do you have a charge for your batteries? Yes, it's uh, right now it's $165. For what kind of battery? It's a lithium ion, and uh, it's, I can't give you the exact you, you know, I mean, you're having a, what, 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 what capacity of uh, life? 24 or? 24? Well, it's 24 hours. It's a, it's a single battery for 24 hours? Yes. Okay. And they're no, that's it. There are no eight hour. Yeah, yeah. There are no eight hour. Um, it was getting too complicated. We had too many different kinds of modems out there with different batteries. So what we did this year is if someone wants a battery for an older modem, we give them, we send them self and salt. We get a new, mo a new faster modem mm -hmm. and they get a new battery, although they do pay for it. And is that 165 installed? On the premises, well, or it's 165, and it's it's like that adapter there that you plug in. There's really nothing to install. There's no. They don't need a service for a service visitation. 
they, they could have one, but they, they would be better for someone to come to the house. So literally, it's an adapter that looks like that. You plug into your modem, and you plug it into the wall. And there's a picture of it in no, no, our filing. I was looking for it. <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, yeah, I find it. Don't worry. Got it. It looks... It's I got kind it. of a smaller drawing. It's, it's, Got it. Yeah. Yeah, Paul doesn't. Okay. I just wanted to follow up on Mr. White's comment related to, I know we talked a lot about copper and things like that. Um, to your point, we see a year over year about a 7% decrease in uh, traditional telephone service um, over the last decade or so. So to the point that there are areas, you know, where there's no cell coverage, where there's no maybe potential wireline competition. But in Vermont, there's a lot of areas, you know, up to 75% with wireline competition. There's cell phone coverage in uh, certainly the major metropolitan areas, a lot where the population exists. So there's a, so we've seen a vast decrease in our traditional copper uh, pod service, wireline telephone service. Other presentations and comments? We have, we have who would like to be to make a presentation and hasn't done so? I can speak, but I have no presentation <laughs> because we do not deliver voice yet. So we don't have a standard operating procedure. We will do soon, which is why I'm here and I want to learn and contribute to the process of figuring it out. Um, I'm sure that I will. Um, replicate some of the things I've heard and some of the things I've read in the FCC document, some of your recommendations. Um, but as long as I'm speaking, I'll, I'll make uh, one comment that suggestion that when you do your when you do your recommendations to the board or the commission, um, there might be a distinction between the different kinds of entities that provide voice services. Um, certainly um, Local exchange carriers are, carry with them a certain obligation. And um, information services don't necessarily carry that same obligation um, and are overlaying local exchange carriers so that there's still the opportunity to have, say, a landline. Or, and, so, and the other aspect of that is there's a distinction between a national mega corporation and a small community-based internet service provider in terms of their ability to fund the things that some of the people from the towns are suggesting might need to be funded by the providers. Um, if, if we were to provide a $165 battery to each customer to check voice, we wouldn't have the deep pockets to support that, and Comcast doesn't either. They charge for that, um, but some likes do provide. So the distinction between large and small companies is important as well. I mean, the FCC even makes those distinctions in awarding points and auctions for licenses and, and exempting for um, paying of USF and other things. So that has to be taken into account as well. Or should I recommend that it is a good time? I just, I just might add that um, when the requirement was that eight hour backup battery our charge was $75, and the take rate was slightly higher, but not by much. 70 what? It was, the take rate for batteries was a little higher than it is now at 165 for a 24 hour battery, but it was extremely, extremely small. $75? That one? It used to be $75 for an eight hour battery, now it's 165 for a 24 hour battery. And the take rate was still, I think it was maybe just more than 1%. Right, so and that's a national figure. I have a question for Mr. White, and that, and that is, um, would you say that that 1% take rate or whatever the middle school one is, is because some customers, admittedly most customers just don't want to spend money, but some customers might find alternate backup battery systems to plug their modems into? Absolutely, and we do have um, customer. This uh, another level of difficulty is that you know, customers can use certain modems that are co compatible with the Comcast system, and they can get their own batteries. And 
and uh, you know, we will, we do not monitor batteries. You know, kind of bring your own. They're, we haven't provided them. We don't know what they are. We can't vouch for them, anything like that. But customers can bring their own modems, and they can bring their own batteries. So, if that were the case, that maybe ten or twenty percent of going out there and getting an empty modem and a ATC battery to plug in, you wouldn't want to charge all of your customers a uniform battery fee when some of them were bringing their own. And out, of, out of interest, out of just curiosity, last night I went on the internet and uh, the, the battery uh, for our current modem is called the XBB1, I believe, and I found a number on eBay, used. You know, and the, you know, the seller will say it's reliable and all that. And, we have no way. You know, some of these are coming from China, Mexico, the other place in the U.S. I thought yeah, it wasn't hard to find just one click, and there they were. And there's no way that who knows what the real status of those batteries is. Well, I guess it means that some people know about the need for batteries. If you've got eye on that, even. And 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 that that brings me back to what we want to do maybe in our next session, which is to talk. I think one of the larger concerns I have is. is discussion we've had about uh, people just don't know that when they have uh, voice over a protocol, despite the, the E911 disclosure thing that they're supposed to sign when they get it, they just don't know that there's a difference. Yeah. How do we overcome that? How does the, the state in its public safety capacity overcome that? Uh, and and uh, I know that it, it, consumer education costs money. Uh, and is it is it the responsibility of the utility to do that? Or in fact, the utility is meeting the federal standard already. Uh, is it the responsibility of the select board to do that? And uh, you know, it's their people, and they know who the people are who never read their flyers, uh, or maybe they do, or maybe they don't. Depending on how big the towns are. Or is it the department's responsibility? Or is it the E911 board's responsibility? Uh, you know, I mean, we haven't talked about uh, Shrewsbury's proposal for an E911 utility. I, I mean, I, I, I asked Ms. Neal to talk about what they do first so that could inform your thoughts. Because I think they do what you were thinking about. No, well, I'll go no, ahead. She's not, she hasn't come back. Well, uh, we've already been at this for an hour and a half. I'm not sure when she's going to be back. Uh, are there other comments? Well, we can wait. Yeah, we can wait a little while if there are other comments. Yes, ma'am. May I ask a question of what you just said? Is it possible that this is really, because of its extensive nature, a shared responsibility? That every group that's involved with the public in the state of Vermont somehow needs to inform them of the difference? Or the or the well, one could say it's already a shared responsibility, and we're at the result we are at because it is that shared responsibility, and it's delivered in the way that it is. I mean, uh, you know, how 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 can you police a person who doesn't read the flyers in their envelopes um, and doesn't you know when they sign that E nine one one thing? You know, I, I know I you know I. Don't know the, I don't have voice over internet protocol, but it wouldn't surprise me if I got a, a package of things that tell me to sign all these things in order to that new phone service, I would just sign all the places where there were X's without necessarily, even with the expertise that I have. And as a lawyer, I would just do that because I want phone service uh, without necessarily being concerned about this particular FCC uh, protection that's out there. Uh, and and how, how do we how do we uh, overcome that uh, that interest and knowledge gap? Uh, you know, uh, yeah, sure, a lot of people are responsible for it, uh, but uh, this is an opportunity to recommend to the legislature a potential fix. And, and what should that be? And, uh, and, and Ms. Neal, you have really good timing because we were just oh. talking. About you. <laughs> okay, uh, I apologize. That's okay. Um, but um, we were talking, I think one of the, one of the principal issues that, that, that's out there that I think troubles the towns in particular is, is uh, people don't know that, that they uh, have batteries if they have them. Uh, 
uh, or what to that, that there's a difference between um, fiber optic service and and copper service uh, generally with regard to loss of power and emergency services. And, and what's the best way? And I, and I know the legislation points to that. Is what are the, what are the ways we can best educate our consumers so that uh, to overcome that? Uh, I'm not sure what kind of role E911 board projects to play. Um, we were going to talk about what your vision was so that you could hear it and we could see what the distinctions were between what you all do and what he's thinking about. Mr. Phillips. Can I just throw, before we get to that sure. issue, yeah. I wanted to follow up on something you were saying also that we were talking about in terms of shared responsibility. Now, I mean, since I make a comment like this in every workshop, this is the time for me to make that comment, <laughs> um, which is that, you know, at the end of the day, if we're talking about an outage that lasts longer than 24 hours, um, there is some responsibility on the part of the power companies. Yeah, I think that's reflected mostly in um, the part of, the, of Act 79 that deals with the E911 board rule, because it actually talks about <coughs> the power company's responsibility for uh, maintaining E911 access during power outages. But I don't want to lose track of that thread that, that the FCC rule is for 24 hours of backup power. Well, I think that's a good connection. And if you go beyond the that, then you're in the right of the role of the I'm local sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. Please. Well, I was just saying that if you go beyond that 24 hours, uh, then you're in a, a different realm. And I think that's the realm in which we're talking about uh, the electric reliability. Or, or in, in combination with local emergency services. What, what is the disaster plan for the town? and they lose power beyond 24 hours. How do they take care of their elderly when that, that occurs? You know, uh, you know, do, do they even have ambulances that they can send out? Do they have, you know, can the firemen get there to do anything? Even just checking on people. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, uh, I've lived through a number of, of major natural disasters and everybody does their best. That there are always gaps. Um, planning helps, especially uh, post-event planning. And how can you fill those gaps? And that's kind of what we're doing here: is attempting to fill both the short-term, the less than 24 hour gap that the FCC has sought to fill, and also to fill the gap within that gap, and, and then to go look beyond as well. So, um, yes, sir. I, I, Probably would know better than me. I think each town uh, has a group or person responsible for the Annie Alley in the town, the street addresses. So there is a function in every town making sure that the addresses, um, when you call 911, you've got to get the address and the phone number synced, the, the Master Street address guide, it's called Annie Alley. There is somebody in each town performing that function so that when emergency services are dispatched, they go to the right place. So there is some a kernel in each town you know, already associated with the United States. Right. That, that's correct. Yeah, so the fiscal coordinator in every town, um, that's actually required by statute. And we rely upon them to provide uh, the address data uh, for their towns when new buildings go up or perhaps addresses change, a new address is added. Um, they provide that data to the 911 board, and um, not only is it important for um, for locating callers on individual calls, it uh, it actually drives GIS data drives the next generation 911 system. That's how call routing is done, um, and how uh, it plays a critical role. <clears throat> So, um, but yes, there is there is a person in every town who has that responsibility. And what do they know? Where everybody where everybody lives? They, uh, well, yeah, so yes, and they tell us. Or, um, it's often it's like a zoning administrator or somebody in, in um, municipal government. Sometimes it's a volunteer. Other times it's it's someone who's um, you know paid within the, the town or city government. Um, typically, a different role. And I, and I can see, just speculating upon it, that, that you know, in, an urban, in a larger urban setting, the concerns we're talking about aren't quite as great uh, because hospitals are not that far apart. Or, 
emergency services aren't necessarily that difficult to access. It's a, it's a larger concern. The reason why we're seeing folks from small towns is because it's the small towns that have that concern. And there are going to be a finite number of people. You know, Vermont only has 630,000 people. Um, you know, uh, I live in Montpelier, and it has 4,000. My fiance lives in Waterville, and there are six, 630. Um, and, and there's a distinction between those places, and it makes it easier in some ways, for the towns to play a role in the small towns than it is to play in the big town. Uh, but, uh, but that is a, that's an important thing. Yes, ma'am. I just, I'm not quite sure where this fits into the conversation if we've already been there while I was gone. So if I'm duplicating, I apologize. But um, you mentioned what role the 911 board might have in this conversation. And one aspect that I'm certain of, but it's not the only aspect that, that you might have input on this on is the consumer education or the public education piece of this. Um, That's what I was hoping you would say. Yes, well, well, it is critical. And, and, there, and historically, there have been many changes in telecommunications um, um, it, uh, technology since the 911 system came into being 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago now. So then, nearly every call was from a, uh, a wireline telephone company, presumably copper lines, um, you know, the line-powered um, systems. And then not too long after we went live came wireless technology. And there was consumer education that was required of that so that people knew that the location information that, that a 911 call taker gets when you call on your wireline is, is quite specific to your specific location. Not so with your wireless phone. And there was an evolution in, so with, your mobile with your mobile wireless phone. Right, okay. So uh, there's been an evolution uh, even in how accurate the information that the wireless carriers provide us um, been an evolution and it, it, it has improved, but it's still not 100%. It's still not. So people need to know that. They need to be aware of the technology that they're using and the benefits and limitations of each, each type of technology. So we have some information available now on our website. Uh, it's something that we are looking at to, um, to uh, improve uh, and also improve our outreach and likely would be through um, efforts with the public service department as well. I think that would make a logical sense. And I'm not saying that that's the only role that I need more to place, but I think it's critical. Just kind of off the point a little bit, but in, in terms of the NELA database, so one thing we offer, it's interconnected VoIP, um, but it is still going over the internet. I mean, although we have a separate channel, we it's a still an internet type phone, but we require our customers, you have to have a registered location. In fact, internet, if you have different kinds of internet phone service, you can take your modem anywhere. Your phone number will follow you around. Not for us, you have to have a registered location so it can be put into the Annie Alley database and so it's actually took, you can't move it. Yes, sir. Um, if you could start with talking about what you envision for your could I have a few minutes to talk about this? Absolutely. At what point would be convenient just to talk about this battery? Since it's out there, go for it. All right. <laughs> I have a question for the for, for Comcast that that's relevant to the discussion. I think I'd like to ask it. I'd like to talk about this and some of the positive and some of the better and some of the. What is that? This is this is a battery. I can see that it has. It is a B, B period B period battery, VRLA rechargeable, BP 7.2-12, made in China. It is what VTEL put in at their expense in my cellar, and I expect that in a town of about 1,100 people, I may be the only one ever to have held this in his or her hands. Um, it wasn't that easy just to disconnect it to bring it up here. I mean, I wasn't sure that I might bend this little wire here that slipped on the negative and the positive terminals and thereby have to buy a new one. 
Um, so this is it. This is how I, as a customer, provide support for the infrastructure on which the company's um, customers pay their fees, and I, I among them. But um, what I wanted to segue from, I mean, th these are not that easy to understand. This comes in a housing, a cyber power unit. I could not disconnect it because I really would have disabled my system. I hope I can reconnect this when I get home. Um, but I did go to, in fact, I made mention, and a positive mention I want to uh, reiterate of what our provider, VTEL, enclosed, enclosed in a, the last bill, which was a, an attention-getting yellow uh, uh, notice that says you can learn more about your battery dependency and, and how to take care of it by going to the website. So I did go to the website and it included the same four pages the, that we submitted as an exhibit previously, we, the town of Shrewsbury, um, the VTEL Gig E Home Battery Information. It's a four-page flyer. The last page says eight-hour batteries, replacements can be obtained at uh, Amazon.com or at bat.com, as well as the following local store, Gray Bar in Rutland, Vermont. Um, it has now, since um, since April, it has an additional four pages. How do I connect to a 20-hour EP, EBPs, electric, sorry, EPBs, um, and that's noted on the yellow flyer as well with a video. It's a seven-minute, 23-second video, which I want to say, I was, I found very uh, positively impressive. Uh, a woman is standing by batteries, including the cyber power unit, which she uncovers to show this battery. And then there are some back, uh, additional batteries that can be purchased for the 24-hour <coughs> service. Um, I would say that that's, I, it, it may not be a best practice, but my telecom does offer a video. I would wonder, and I, maybe we are not going to be able to get around to the, each of the representatives here, but I think it would be useful to know. Maybe they could respond in their written follow-up. Um, do you have a, 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 a video that actually shows it shows it uh, shows how to do some of these things. It seems to be pretty simple. There's a plug-in. It's, it's like what Comcast apparently says, at least for the extra batteries. Um, I would like to know from my provider, VTEL, how many visits that particular video has had. I think that would tell us something about the responsiveness, whether it's less than 1%, more than 5%, 18.5%. Uh, or, uh, of the customer base, how many people have actually looked at this video? Maybe it's just me this morning. I don't know. But maybe the company can tell us how many hits you've had on, on this. I then... Um, Do you want to answer that question? I was just going to say, at least two of you, because I looked at it last week. <laughs> <laughs> Jackpot. I looked at it. And so, and so you know, I mean, I, mean, you know, I don't want to say this, but I don't want to extend too long either. Um, I mean, I, don't, um, I, I wanted to make this, this final observation, which is not such a positive one. I did call Gray Bar, all right? And I'm not sure I'll find my notes here, but the person said, we're getting a lot of calls. The state of Vermont has been referring a lot of people to us. And um, we, actually, you would do much better to call interstate. Now, we brought some to the attention of the first workshop, uh, our calls to Gray Bar, which finally ended up in there saying, stop calling us. We don't have it. We can order it. Um, this person was very helpful. I, I certainly appreciate it and express that appreciation. He said, look, we could order it, but none of our warehouses across the nation stock it. I'm, I'm, you know, my utility tells me to go there. It is that battery you have in front of you? No, it's the... Well, I'm just calling about batteries. I said eight hour or 24 hour. 
and he was answering for both. We don't we don't stock those. We do other. They provide other services to uh, electricity electric customers of various types. They're they're well regarded. I think Grave is. But they don't have it in their warehouses. They can order it. He said, frankly, you know, if you have to pay for shipping and handling, you're going to pay more with us, Vtel, than you would by going to our, our, our competitor, Interstate. Um, they, 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 they have them under direct supply. Um, and so, I mean, I really think that between April and, and September, It's not a good practice. It's not a best practice. It's pretty. It's a. It's a bad practice to be referring people with your card to a website that then refers you to somebody who tells you, "Don't buy from us. Buy from somebody else." Now the web. The video has several other parties there. You can also buy from some solar units. It does just happen to have two <coughs> solar suppliers within their service area. I'm in Rutland. The people in Perkinsville and Springfield are not as handy to me as the people that I ran into yesterday who were installing in the town of Shrewsbury. So, I mean, I think we could look at the entire VTEL service area. That would be a better practice to give the list of a comprehensive list of suppliers in a wider area for solar backup and for available batteries. So I'm making a few points that are both positive and not so positive. Um, and I think this offers, I'm trying to offer a, an example of the kind of detailed comparison that we could and should engage in in looking at what various companies are doing. My question was to the Comcast, I'll just inject you and then stop, was we have had an, a, an offer or a proposal from the eight Arlex to uh, voluntarily, not if directed or required, but voluntarily to offer some better practices that some of their um, some of them do offer. And I would wonder if, and Comcast's submission, which was very helpful and thorough and informative, did not in any way talk about best practices, just talked about current practices and their being compliant. So I, my question would be, and it doesn't have to be answered now, gone a little bit too long perhaps, but um, is would you subscribe and would the other covered service companies subscribe to at least at a minimum that same list at least as a voluntary, and then we'll get into discussion about what perhaps the legislature or the PUC might wish to require. But I would like to know if that which I thought was a, a you know, a very interesting and positive proposal from Mr. Phillips's clients would be a proposal that others would join in. And I'll speak about the alternative entity at some point. Um, I'd yeah, offer that you can, if, if you're prepared to answer that, you can answer it now. I, I will require that you answer it before the next, in writing, before the next meeting. So uh, you may want to defer your answer to then. So I, I think we'll reserve comment. I think, you know, to lump them all together, yeah. discuss practices without identifying specific ones and, and the costs, et cetera. You know, I, I couldn't answer that now. In addition, we're on a national platform. Yeah. You know, it will... I had the same thought that it would be useful to find out what the larger company thought about, thought about the Arlex proposal as well, which is why I asked in the next round of comments that you comment on each other so that we can capture those. Um, you know, I can get along, I can do what the Arlex said if that is an answer or not. Yes. Can I ask a, this is Clay Burvis with the department. Can I ask a clarifying question of uh, Mr. Gibson and maybe a VTEL as well? Um, you spoke of the battery. Um, it, it, was there a battery, a single battery that fit into the same housing, or are you required to buy additional housing for that battery? And is that a separate issue from? Uh, your efforts to buy the particular battery replacement? Well, as they sometimes say, I'm glad you asked. I was just inquiring this morning about a battery, this type of battery, um, or a 24-hour battery a single 24-hour battery on the 
Vitel website, and and, uh, and 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 Comcast has referred to a single, I believe, a single 24-hour battery. So there are all kind of batteries out there, and Vitel's website points you to some other sources. The question that we need a technical answer for is whether any of those other batteries that are out there in the marketplace at differing prices and shipping and so forth, are they compatible with the housing that VTEL installed and that I'm sort of, you know, set with, if you will, locked into maybe, I don't know what my, I'm, I'm not technically capable to say I could go to a whole other system and still tie it into their optical terminal, network terminal. I don't know that. But I have been told that the answer is no, that I've got to buy a certain type of battery and a certain housing has to do with the leads or how they connect or something from the battery pack out to the optical network terminal. So I really can't shop around necessarily. I haven't tried the shopping around and I'm not gonna buy those things just to try them out one after the other. But I believe there may be some constraints by what VTEL shows knowingly, presumably, I mean they didn't put stuff in they didn't know anything about, from a vendor to put into their customers' houses, uh, uh, re residences or, or place of business. I, I don't know, I think that's a very, very important question about compatibility. Um, uh, Mr. White has, has talked about customers are probably dealing with things to hook up to directly to their motor. Now this, this, is, a, this is a different sort of setup, I think, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, um, this doesn't power, uh, this doesn't power the motor, this powers the outside terminal. That is probably not functioning now if my wife is hoping to use it. But, um, um, and this had nine hours. When I checked it before a preceding workshop, I just, un I just unplugged it so it didn't get any power. It started beeping after a while. I kept picking up the phone. I think I related this previously. I kept picking up the phone. It, it, did, it wasn't as some of my neighbors were trying to say about these, these terrible utilities. It only lasted one hour. I mean, it lasted nine hours. I was pleased that I had, but right now it's not functioning. So. Where it's supposed so, to Mr. Function. Gibson, that's that's a fairly standard battery. Okay, thank you. Um, you'll find dozens of places that sell them. Thank you. The way to distinguish one from another is how many amp hours they're rated at. Yes. And, how, and the terminals on the top. These guys. Yeah. And yeah so right. they vary a little bit, but once you know how many amp hours you want and the dimensions yes. and whether the terminals are on the top or the side, you can then go online or go to battery places. They'll have them, okay. generally speaking. Okay. And they don't know them as eight hour or 24 hour batteries. They know them as so many amp hour batteries. Right, 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 right. And so many volts. It's got to be the right numbers of volts, too, 12 or 6. Right, right, right. 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 Sure. But those are very standard. And, and um, will, they work they in the work. will they work in the housing that I have? You're saying they're very standard, but we had a big discussion on our town listserv about people trying to find these batteries. And the only solution so far they have is hire an electrician who comes and rewires the connection yeah. to the VTEL. So somebody on your list serve needs to tell people that they can just look at the label on the side and then go online and copy that into Google and find them. So well, right. she's referring to the same thing that I've been uh, informed of by a person who is quite technically knowledgeable. That, that, that there's something about the connection from the house <laughs> to the well, NID or the, the ONT or whatever. The confusion may be that the, the housing that you're talking about is specific to the ONT system. So the housing is what essentially interfaces with the ONT and uh, provides the services that you get through the ONT. Thank you. So the, the battery itself, as Michael said, is a standard issue, 12 okay. volt. You, that's why we give you the model number. You can get it on Amazon. They're relatively available. Um, so that can be swapped out. It's not a, a battery that's specific to the, the backup unit that is installed when we provide a, or when we install a fiber service to the residents. 
mean, is this supposed to be easy for Joe homeowner? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's about as easy as swapping out a flashlight battery. Well, well it's not, because the flashlight batteries, a pair of C batteries, or you have double A batteries. There's different types this of is, batteries, this, certainly, yeah, but this in terms is, of this is, connections and how yeah. long it takes to do it, it's a, you open the unit, you take out the battery, and you replace it. Right, with but this, this discussion itself illustrates that this is a consumer problem. This is something that, that ordinary <coughs> folks need to be educated about. We recognize that that was part of the feedback that we took from some of the earlier sessions, and that was part of the, the impetus for creating a DIY type video that you can find for pretty much anything yeah. these days, and you can step yourself through it. You know, there's about three steps to replacing a battery, and Give it, it looks name. like we've got you about 100 this, people that have seen it so far. I'm sorry, yeah. Give it a name, call it something. It's a 12 volt battery with the BP 7.2 model number, so you find that and it fits in there. It's just not a cylinder. It's heavy. <coughs> it's lead. It says it has a big X here that across the garbage can. PP. Well, you know, it seems to me... Oh, were you well, I, I was just going to say that, you know, this, this gets back to what I was saying before, which is that the, these companies aren't in the business of designing the equipment. They're just in the business of using the equipment to provide a service. Um, and so what we're proposing in our comments is additional consumer education, including item, I think, B4 on is a DIY instructional video for consumers to see, you know, in a, a person doing it so they can follow along and do it themselves. And, and we're not going to be able to redesign the batteries or make them more like flashlight batteries. But, but the best that we can do is to make it as simple as possible for the customer to learn how to do it. And that's a big step because that, that outreach has not yet happened in any comprehensive way. And that's really one of the things we'll be looking at. Yeah. We to figure out. I think that was my comment is that, you know, phone service used to be easy. You call the phone company, they install the service, you use the phone. And it's become much more complicated now. Um, you know, we, we welcome the services, the, the additional services that come, but there really is a, a missing piece there in terms of consumer education about what is involved, what the cost is of having those additional services. Um, and this backup battery business, I just, I mean, between the technical knowledge, the, the limit of the life, how you can extend those batteries, how you check them, how you monitor them, how you replace them, and then back to the cost. I mean, there, there's a lot that still needs to be addressed there. Um, and I think it would be wonderful if it didn't all fall on the customer. Um, adding to that, I mean, we have put all the different providers of all different services in one bin. And earlier you were talking about a Tesla versus a Model T. But for the residents of Andover, we're not talking about choosing between a Tesla and a Model T. We're talking about the road. Um, you cannot get Comcast in Andover. They don't offer services there. We are reliant on our state regulated utility for telephone service. Most of the town doesn't get telephone service. There is no competition for VTEL for telephone service in Andover. So I'm worried that the larger issues for all of the state, you know, Burlington gets a lot of attention, Montpelier gets a lot of attention, but if the state is regulated and the state's laws only work for Burlington and Montpelier, they will not work for Andover because we don't have choices. We're not deciding between a Tesla and a Model T. We have one road in this town, and it's VTEL. And they have a monopoly because it's a trade-off between being regulated by the state and having that monopoly. There's also the issue of how do we serve clients who aren't served by the marketplace, which would not be Andover. It's a very small town with very few people. People don't want to compete there. There's nothing to compete for. So I really appreciate hearing all these different ideas, but I also want, when you're thinking about how to present this to the legislature, I hope you'll consider the fact that there's a lot of different issues here 
not because for some people they have choices and for some people they don't have a choice that they take and and for now this choice is an extreme change for over a hundred years people have expected the power for their telephone system to come from the telephone company we all understand that there's a battery to work the telephone but for the telephone system this is a huge change in a small amount of time and it's certainly for us in Andover taking a while for us to catch up but I have to say I don't know if that was a good change and as you're considering this in other small towns in Vermont whether they should be subjected to the same thing well, thank you Mr. Gibson, did you want to talk about your 911 utility? I recollect that earlier you were going to give Mrs. Meal a chance to ex talk a little bit more about what they do. Maybe maybe that has sufficed. I don't know. I'd be happy to. Do you have more you want to say that? Um, what they well, at a very high level, the 911 board is responsible for the oversight and management of the statewide 911 system. Um, so we provide, we, uh, through our contracted system provider, uh, the 911 system to which telephone companies <coughs> connect and um, process those 911 calls and get them into the hands of the responders who then respond. Um, I, I, I don't know what level of detail you want me to. I think it might be useful. Mr. Gibson, if you talked about sure. what you were envisaging, and then she could talk about whether she fits. I would love it if, I would love to, for us to have um, a, conver a, a more extensive conversation than I think we're gonna have at, at, at 3.35 today about this. Maybe to some extent it could be continued at the fourth workshop. Um, if you're not prepared, we can wait to I No, I, I, well, I'm not fully prepared. Okay. Uh, but but I, 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 let me just do a little intro and, and stop there. Um, because it is an intriguing idea, so I want to make sure we all hear it. Well, and I, I don't think I was the only one to mention it. Um, maybe at the first workshop. Um, as I understand, it was in it was in the nineties that um, electric utilities were being expected by some quarters of the society to offer energy conservation services as well as energy supply services and they were doing this in a fairly in, they were doing each they were doing it in different ways and some were going fairly far to offer different kinds of information and, and services and, and maybe some financial incentives for people to buy new new water heaters, more efficient water heaters insulate their houses what have you and so others weren't and in the around 2000, um, Vermont, uh, the idea of an efficiency, uh, energy efficiency utility took shape. I believe, I mean, the public service department has a, a description of efficiency utilities. Uh, I don't need to read that, but it is available on their website. The short summary of efficiency Vermont, how it came about. I mean, not how it came about, what it does. And I have actually in front of me now uh, a, an early description of that. It's, it's rather outdated now, so I wouldn't think it'd be too valuable to circulate. But Efficiency Vermont, as I understand it, was, was created and then was modified about seven or eight years later, maybe around 2008, in terms of its structure. Um, and the legislature, is, as I gather, um, what, uh, and the public, at that time the public service board, um, were both involved in, in 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 the creation and the structuring, and that it's an it's a it's an order of appointment, it's a contractual sort of arrangement. Um, monies flow through an energy efficiency charge on the electric consumers' bills, 
and what Efficiency Vermont has done in my community, in my house, and around the state, and, and, and in a way that's uh, exemplary in the nation, is to help people save energy, save money, save energy, address climate change, whatever agenda is at the top of, of, of the list, if not all three combined, um, and others. Um, and, and they've done it very well, and, and the utilities uh, certainly have their own programs and incentives and, and outreach, um, but um, Efficiency Vermont does the job. And it just struck me anyway and some other folks that we have a situation here where there are gaps. Maybe they're limited to the rural towns that don't have cell service. Maybe it's, maybe it's um, a, a, a minority of the, of the customers of a, of a, of a you know, the, the people who don't have generators. Uh, <coughs> the, but but it, it does exist. It's a public safety issue. It's very real. My community got involved in the outset because we had a two and a half day, I mean twice the 24 hours, and people were without and didn't know what to do and didn't really connect the dots until they said, oh, you couldn't make a call? I couldn't make a call either. What would have happened if you had had a chimney fire? What would have happened if you had an accident? How did you, you know, pay your overdue, you know, uh, payment uh, 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 if you couldn't reach uh, to, to give your credit card information, whatever it might have been. Um, couldn't reach, couldn't reach a, a service provider of some kind. Not, uh, uh. So it seemed that maybe the, the utility seemed to vary in their practices. Um, some have the videos, some don't. Some will send out an installer and let the customer pay. I haven't heard anyone who says we can get you a loan. Uh, uh, you know, we can help you. We, we're, work, we're working with our local comprehensive community action agency, which has a, a low energy loan program, or which has bought a number of these batteries in bulk, and you can get them from your town or from your community service agency if, if you're a lower income person or you know, a special needs person or just a customer who you know is not too acquainted with this. We can actually get it installed. Like, like in Fishy Vermont, we'll send around teams to install the insulation um, and other energy saving efficiency. So it seemed to me that energy, energy saving uh, uh, measures, it seemed to me that there might be a model there where the utilities vary. They don't really want to do too much beyond what they're required federally. Maybe there is some reluctance or some inability of the state of Vermont to require maybe what's needed but uh, of the utilities, but that doesn't mean that what's needed shouldn't be delivered and provided. And perhaps there is a mechanism analogous, and we'll have to look at it and just see what the comparisons, what the differences are, uh, looking at Efficiency Vermont's structure and, and, and uh, contract and evaluation procedures. Maybe there's a way to have a, a, a desire, a, 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 util, a value in having um, and considering the creation of an entity that would provide these kinds of services that aren't being provided presently. Best practices, financing opportunities, technical assistance, on-site individual interactions with customers, uh, information to customers. How would that be paid for? We talked earlier about, you know, you got to find money for this stuff. If it's worth doing, it's worth finding money for. Maybe a, uh, I mean, I alluded to the uh, re regulatory recovery cost. I don't know where they're being used now, but there could be other Vermont instituted charges that, yes, everyone would have to pay for, um, but that would be in the society's best interest. That's about as much as I'm able to say at the moment in terms of what the concept was that, uh, and that concept I think must have been included in the legislative um, directive because it said, or other entities, or alternative entities, okay, without specifying what, but I think that that might have been a concept. I, 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 I was over in the State House and, and there were some conversations about, you know, if, if the utilities can't do it, who could? And I, I did not hear a reference to the E911 board doing it. 
So they they are referenced in another section of that statute to, to do certain to do their rulemaking, but not 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 here. So maybe it was the maybe a, a efficient a, a E nine one one utility was such an alternative entity, and and the legislature will want to know if if the PUC has has looked at that as part of its mandate to report back with recommendations, and it needs to look at it. So. Maybe it's, maybe it's up to you to decide how we look at it, Mr. Mr. Hearing Officer. And this this may have taken a little different uh, direction than Jonathan, but uh, in Shrewsbury, when we came back from one of the, the first workshop, several of us met, and it was a brainstorming session. Um, and some of the things that were talked about were, you know, so how, you know, how about how do we get people backup gener generators? Are there hand generators? Are there solar ba battery charges? Um, what do we do to reach out to people in, in the community, in the neighborhood? Should we should be neighborhood groups? Um, what about satellite phones? What about locations in towns, fire, you know, the, the volunteer fire station, the, the, you know, the town office, other places where be, people could go or where there could be a, a, a small mini tower? Um, what about the 2G towers that you're talking about? What about outreach and education? Um, the, the session was a little amorphous, and creation of some organized, informed, um, knowledgeable um, body or group of people who could help each of these communities do these things would be terrific. I understand, and, and that's what I thought you were going to talk about. Uh, I have a great deal of familiarity with the EEUs. Uh, I work with them a lot on, on the EU team. Uh, and one of my peers, uh, when I mentioned, uh, yeah, and, and they're very, very useful there. They, they are shaping the way Vermont's energy, and it's not just energy efficiency Vermont, there are a couple other ones too. But they're, they're reshaping the way Vermont uh, and Vermont's consumers use energy as well as Vermont businesses. Uh, that's, that's a unique problem that's been out there and been worked through for several years. Uh, and I think in some ways, and I mentioned the idea to one of my colleagues upstairs who does more with the E-8911 board than I do. And he's like, well, you don't need that. You got the E-911 board. Because hmm. uh, that is kind of their charter. It's a very similarly uh, state-chartered and funded organization that has a very discreet E-911 oversight, E-911 oversight uh, mission. Um, I think, I, I don't know, maybe I'm misstating what this Neil passed on earlier, but it sounds like what he's envisaging is, which, what he's thinking about is what you're doing. Well, not, not to the extent, I mean, we still need to have a program in place, like, like efficiency Vermont or... Well, it would be a much more discreet look. I think, I think in some ways efficiency Vermont touches people in different ways than, than you do. And, and I'm not I'm not familiar, uh, very familiar even with efficiency Vermont, but I'm you know, looking to see what the model looks like. Um, but we don't currently, we certainly uh, uh, think that it's a good idea to expand different kinds of telecommunication services in Vermont uh, so that Vermonters have more options or, or an option um, wherever they are, but we don't, we don't fund that. We don't build those networks or support those networks. Um, we provide the system to which they direct their 911 calls. Um, so, uh, so I, I need to think on on how the 911 board would fulfill. Oh, I'm not sure we. I'd have to look. I'm not even sure we have the authority. Well, yeah, I think that the, the similarity between the 911 board and the EU is maybe, maybe why I think it might be the right fit with some growth corrected by the legislature to ensure it can meet all the missions that you're thinking about. Is that fundamentally what the EEUs do is they reduce demand for energy. pretty discreet thing that touches a lot of parts of many people's lives. And, um, and it's both uh, 
and, and like you said, yeah, I've had an energy audit done. I've, I've received rebates for my my solar hot or my hot water heater, you know, and, and it's reduced the amount that I reduce energy, and it's, it's affected me that way. I think when, when Ms. Neal was talking about the role of the E911 board earlier, um, I was particularly happy to hear her talk about that again. Um, because that's where it starts. You have to understand your problem before you can address it. Uh, and you have to understand it with discrete data related to real events. Uh, and I, there's a lot of great speculation here. There's a lot of great uh, stories being told about what's happened in certain circumstances, anecdotal information. But the kind of data that will show when there's a gap is what's needed to show how do you, how do you fix it. Um, and I think that they're already on the road to doing that. Um, whether it, and they do have the same kind of uh, independence that, that, that the EU's had, at least initially, as contracted entities, and which the EU's now have as independent utilities. Um, so there, there are a lot of similarities. So I'm not, I'm not disregarding the idea. I'm saying that, it, but, that it's a good idea, but it may already be there. Something might already thought about it. One, well, the purpose of a workshop like this is people play off of other people's critiques, comments. I, I am very aware that um, use of the term E911 utility, wherever it first came from, um, is a misnomer for what our, my, my thinking anyway, was. Because that limits it to emergency 911 communications. And the problem that's been addressed by the communities here and by individual consumers is not just, and that's the, that's the point of the spear. That's where it really pierces. Um, if, if someone can't reach an emergency, uh, responder when that person needs help. But it's really almost going back to the department's initial petition. The problem is that we have entered this new era of telecommunications that's been well spoken to and that we're all well aware of and all benefit from. It's a backup power. It's the backup. It's the reliance of the new telecommunication systems on, ele on, on electri separate electricity. It's the backup power problem that really that needs addressing. How can citizens be equipped? And it kind of overlaps rather, rather quickly into energy management. How can citizens be equipped to self-provision, if that's, if that's the term, um, energy supply to their telecommunication system, whatever the circumstances of needing that system, whether it is daily communication with a relative or a business purpose or, you know, or, 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 a, or a dire emergency. So I, I guess I would like to just end this monologue by, by saying that the con I don't want to miss the concept because of a misnomer in, in the terminology that was initially and, and, and abetted by me used. Um, it, it's more about helping Vermonters take care of their need for electric power, backup power, in order to communicate. Yes, sir. So, yeah, okay. I, I think there's still some very good ideas for the internet. And um, I think it's enhanced now on a matter of urgency. So I think it's, we're still safe with the terminology. But I, I, it's a great hook. Whether it's going to be for other kinds of communications or not, when the power companies are out, they need to have a backup system. And um, it makes some sense to tie it to the internet or not. It could even be argued tied to efficiency Vermont because if 
we're not talking about a lot of different kinds of products to distribute, just some batteries, maybe it doesn't make sense to have a whole new organization, unless it's involved in a lot of products. Uh, I was one of a dozen uh, founders of the Plainfield Co-op about 50 years ago, and the co-op wasn't a food store. It, it evolved and moved to Montpelier and became the fancy dancy store, but it originally was a buyer's co-op. And what we did was we bought sacks of flour, but we also bought chainsaws. We bought all kinds of stuff for the townspeople who joined as members of the co-op. I'm not suggesting every town or every region should rely on a co-op, but that sort of model is roughly what you're talking about. And one thing that's attractive about using, is it EEU, is that what you call it? Energy efficiency and utility. Using that sort of structure is that it's funded with appropriations. No, no, no not at all. Ratepayer dollars. It's ratepayer dollars. Ratepayer dollars. Okay. As well as the dollars that come from customers who take advantage of it when they do make yeah. payment. Okay, well then that shoots down my argument about helping people who can't afford to pay as much, because I like the graduated tax system helping that out. Maybe it should be funded by appropriated dollars. Um, that way the people who are less able to afford can still get the $2 light bulb that other people helped pay for, or the $2 battery or whatever. So we could consider that as a, a justice issue. Um, um, that's actually a good segue into what I wanted to comment on. And I think I feel compelled to talk about it since the department represents ratepayers. Um, is cost. There is concern over cost related to consumers needing to purchase battery backup. Um, there's also concern over something like, for lack of a better word, we're calling it the E911 utility. Um, Efficiency Vermont is funded by ratepayers. Another utility would be funded by ratepayers, um, presumably. Or if we go another down another road, there was a mention of the 911 board uh, having some sort of role. They are funded through the USF fund, which is funded by providers that charge consumers for that. Either way or any way, the consumer is going to pay for this somehow. So I just wanted to bring that up as an issue uh, and one that the department is concerned about. Which I think is why, if there's a fundamental concern I have, is to meet the public safety concern. Was, is there that red button that I talked about the last time? Uh, as opposed to maybe some of the other things you were thinking about. Uh, and I think that's why I was pleased to hear Ms. Neal talk about what where they're going in the P911 board, because that, that might shape what the red button looks like. But, uh, any of that. Um, okay, we've been talking for a long time. Why don't we take a 10-minute break, and I'll come back with some ideas that will shape our next meeting, and we can talk about that next meeting. So five after the hour. So ten after the hour. Okay, thanks all for coming back uh, so quickly. Um, it's now a little after four. I think we're probably done for today. Uh, I did want to talk about the next session. Uh, I have also talked a little bit about uh, you know, interim uh, documents to be filed by the interested parties. Uh, the dates I'm thinking about, uh, if these are too near, let me know. But I'm thinking October 10th would be the next filing from the parties and that it would address sort of uh, comments on the proposals that were articulated in the documents that were filed uh, on the 12th, uh, in particular on uh, the RLEX uh, recommendation and any other uh, best practices that, that have been proposed uh, by the parties, whether or not they are uh, reasonable and how they might be achieved. So that would, that would come in on the 10th, as well as uh, any final recommendation uh, that the interested party might have. Um, 
then we would, have, we would follow that up with another workshop on the 17th. And this is really just kind of uh, a final opportunity to uh, address uh, what came in on the 10th and to help shape uh, the final uh, look at the, uh, what would be the recommendation and the report from the commission. Uh, again, the way, the way that would go forward is that uh, I would craft an initial document sometime between October 17th and Thanksgiving, or let's say and, and Veterans Day. Uh, uh, and I would make that available for comment for a week or so, and then a final document would be rendered by would be issued by the, the commission based on that any changes that are made to that draft document based on your inputs. And that would come out in time to, I think it's December 15th, I don't remember exactly, for the, for the report of the legislature. Yes, sir. Oh, and I just know October 17th is a, a problem from our, for our government relations folks who have a okay. out of state conference on the 16th and 17th. Okay. And the eight, and that would kind of carry over to the 18th as a travel day, so it could be early the next week. Okay. After, you know, is it? Oh, that sounds good. 21st is fine. It would, would not work. For some of us. Okay. The two of it would not work. Are the government relations people here today? Are the government relations people? Yeah, I know myself. I will not be available on the 17th. I, I know I'm out of town. The 18th. You're out of town. I'm out of town, and my colleagues will all be out of town. Oh, okay. I didn't know. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. How about the 15th? We can push the, uh, the due date for the uh, document ahead to the 8th. I'm sorry, the department can't do the 15th. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about uh, the 21st? Yeah. That, that's a what day of the week? It's Monday. Monday. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. So we'll continue with the, uh, the documents to. Uh, we'll make the documents due on uh, Friday the 11th. So then we'll look at them until the next morning. And then we'll have uh, our next session together on the 21st. <coughs> Great. Yes, ma'am. At the beginning, we talked about uh, the introducing a report that that um, addresses the requirements that the legislature gave you or how the 901 board might support? Yes. Is and that I, you would like by the 10th? Yes, please. The yes, please. Okay. And then we can all comment on that. That'll, that'll inform any further discussion we might have in the notion of a, of a, of a, of a uh, U911 utility. Okay. Any other Great, thank you all for your patience and your good comments.